Okay, so uh, a few announcements before we get started today. Uh, test on Tuesday. I believe you have 20 questions, either 20 or 25. I'm a little murky. <laughs> a lot of them are small calculations, okay? So you will have the entire hour and 20 minutes. I think it's actually an hour and 21 minutes because I learn requires at least a one minute grace period. <laughs> so um, you, and you know, I intend you to do it during class. So it will, it will open up um, at 9.30 and it will shut down at the end of class something like that. So you'll need to take it during the class period. Um, I will email out tables. I, I suspect a lot of you have tables. If you have a book, you'll have tables in there. I'll email you out the tables that I have that I'll be working from today. Um, it's fair game. Um, you know, you really, you really need to not do any sort of a calculator. I mean, you know, people are going to be taking it electronically, so I guess I really can't enforce that, but you're really shortchanging yourself if you don't learn how to do this stuff. Um, so, I mean, it will come back to bite you, fundamentals of engineering, if we ever get back to in-class testing, <laughs> uh, it's going to come back and bite you. So, you really need to dig down and uh, learn how to operate in these tables. Um, I'm sorry, what? You're referring to a fundamental measure in test, right? Yeah. The, the SE test? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's the first of the licensing exams. Okay. And then PE. The PE is four or five years later, whatever the time frame is on that. Um, quick question. Do you recommend the sample engineers getting their professional? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely. Um, there, there's a cert, there are certain careers that require it, certain career paths. Uh, if you're going into like the HVAC design world, that sort of thing, you absolutely have to have it. Um, um, maybe, maybe not. It depends. It depends what you're going to do. Um, if you're producing something that requires plans to be stamped by a professional engineer, then obviously you can't rise up in the company if you don't become a professional engineer. I would say 15 to 20% of the jobs out there would, would probably require a PE or it would great, be greatly advantageous. The situation is though, you don't know where you're gonna wind up. You graduate, you get a job, you think you know where you're gonna wind up, but life happens, things happen. And if you don't pass that FE your senior year, you're going to struggle. I've had students that didn't pass it, that went out and wound up, uh, Boyd Johnson doesn't mind me using his name. He's pretty high up now at IC Thomason, which is an HVAC design engineering firm. There are multi-locations around the country. Got a really good job. Well, after a year or two working at IC Thomason, Boyd, <laughs> the light comes on. Hey, I'm gonna have to get registered if I'm gonna have a career here. Well. He took the, F, the FE, but didn't pass it because he didn't take it seriously. Well, so then he's got to start taking the FE. And then after four years, he takes the PE. Well, he takes the FE. Well, he fails it again. Because, you know, he kind of forgot all his calculus. He kind of forgot his chemistry. He forgot his physics. He forgot his dynamics. He forgot everything except what he was using at IC Thomason. So then he's married. He's got a couple kids. He's got a full-time job, and he has to go back and review all this subject matter so he can pass the FE exam. So push come to shove, he took it like three more times. He finally passed it in his fourth year, and two weeks later he took his PE, and he passed both of them. <laughs> now, do you have to take the FE? No, absolutely not. Do I strongly recommend it? Absolutely. And because it's never gonna be easier than it will your senior year. Because most of it is just fundamental stuff. Thermal one, thermal two, heat transfer, dynamics, statics. Well, heavens, you go out, you know, 
work two or three years and then start trying to take that calculus? Oh man, good luck. That's right. I mean, I know y'all are smart, but we all forget things pretty quick when we don't use them. So anyway, that's my tirade on that. So yes, I definitely recommend that you take that FE seriously. Okay, so in preparation and, you know, so that I don't <laughs> blitz through this material too quickly, uh, I thought we would just work problems today. And this is the last one we're going to work if we get that far. So let me see here. Find out. These are tables, tables. Okay, three, six. So three, six, I, I figured I'd start with the, the, the first ones, a little simpler, a little quicker, and then we'll build in complexity. Um, so problem three, six, uh, we're working with water and it's just to get you into the steam tables and work with that a little bit. Uh, so locate the state on a sketch of a temperature specific volume diagram. So, you know, w when you're doing these things, you're not sure whether you're uh, a mixture of liquid, a saturated liquid, saturated vapor, compressed, superheated, whatever, then you, you pick your favorite diagram. Uh, TV's fine, a PV's fine. Later on, we'll work with a, a temperature, uh, a TS, temperature entropy diagram, but we haven't defined the entropy yet. So uh, the, the author likes the TV and, and it's fine with me. I don't think it's my favorite, but nonetheless, it's fine. So this first state is 140 degrees C and it gives you a specific volume. 0.5 meters cubed per kilogram. So find the pressure. Well, okay, so what you do is you draw you a stick figure here, you know, just a, just a sketch. It, don't have to, it doesn't have to be pretty, you know, temperature specific volume. Draw you a little dome on there, just something like that. And then he draws a line straight across to represent his temperature. And you draw it as far as you want to, long as your ruler is. And then he's gonna come up and put an ISO bar so this line up here and then across and then on up here is a line of constant pressure. Now at this point, all he knows is 140 and a specific volume. Okay, so how do we get numbers? Well, we have to go to the tables and start looking, okay? So let's see, I got so many things open. Uh, let's see, I'm on the, I think this is the one I want. Yeah, this is the SI units, and we're in SI on this problem. Uh, and I'm likely to give you both sets of units. I'm sorry, but I want you to be, you know, conversant in both. Yes, they, and I will email these to you. Yeah, yeah. But yes, I mean, th these tables are definitely in the book. Um, so let's see here. So. Table A2 is the saturation table based on temperature. And then A3 is based on pressure. Uh, it's still temperature and there's pressure. So let's see if I could remember the problem. What do I know? I know uh, 140, okay? So I wanna go back up to the temperature table and there's 140. And so this is um, 140. If we're saturated, this will be our pressure, but we're not sure because we have to check in terms of specific volume, okay? So if it was all saturated liquid, our specific volume would be 0 0.001097, 0 that's, that's the liquid. And on the vapor side, it's 0.5089. Well, is 0.5 in between those numbers? Heck yeah, it is. So that tells you that we are a mixture of saturated liquid, saturated vapor. And if we're a mixture, our pressure, ha and it's 140 degrees C, our pressure has to be 3.613. Has to be. Okay. Now, let's go back to the solution. And also, I want you to look at 100 because the numbers he writes in that solution are wrong. He writes the numbers for 100, even though he gives the correct pressure. <laughs> so what's happened, this book has been out there a long time and they've had these problems and they've changed numbers in them 
and sometimes all the numbers don't get changed quite right in the solutions. And I apologize for that, but you know, that's just the way life is. So you gotta be careful. So, but if you come back over here, you see he's got 0 0.0010435 and 1.673. Well, that's not right for 140, that's right for 100. So in a previous edition of this book, he had this temperature, this problem set at 100, probably the same specific volume, and it still turns out to be saturated, even though the pressure, if it was 100, the pressure would be 1.014 bar. But since we're at 140, it's 3.613, okay? So, all right. So that's the first one, and he, you know, to his credit, he got the pressure right. So, you know, if that's a 10 point problem, I'd probably hit him too. <laughs> just for being careless, just to, just to kind of get, wake him up, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta slap him a little bit to wake him up. There you go, okay. So, um, B, we're given a pretty high pressure, 30 megapascals and 100 degrees C. That's pretty high pressure. And so again, he's drawn a TV diagram with a dome. Uh, he draws a line for a hundred. And now here, it, it, I'm not sure at what point you realize this, but it, you know, when you see a pressure that high, you can go check the critical pressure to see, because if that pressure is above the critical pressure, you can't get into the dome, okay? And so, well, how would you check the critical pressure? Well, we can go back to this same table. One way to do it is if you go up here, you've got table A1 has some, has, uh, some critical constants and water happens to be in the table. And so you see the critical pressure is 220.9 bar, okay? Well, next issue that comes up you gotta be able to convert megapascals to bars. <laughs> and in my world, I always have to look it up because I don't remember the metric stuff because I usually work in the English units. But anyway, so that converts to 300 bar. So if the critical pressure is 220.9, you are well above critical pressure. So he draws this, and this is an isobar, a line of constant pressure. And this one just touches the dome up here at the little dot. Now, it looks like his artist didn't do a great rendition of that, but these things are kind of hard to draw, you know. But conceptually, this critical isobar only touches the dome at that point. It's just tangent to the dome at that one point and then goes on up. Well, if that's uh, 220.9 two bar and we're at 300 bar, then we're on an isobar that's out here because th this is a higher pressure than this, okay? And so he draws that down here and wherever this isobar for 300 crosses uh, the 100 degree, Fahrenheit, or degree centigrade line is the point that he has given us, okay? So that's the point that he's given us. So what, what state is that? Well, that's compressed liquid or subcooled liquid. Because, you know, at 100, what's the saturation pressure at 100 C? Well, that's atmospheric pressure. That's 1.014 bar, and we're at 300. <laughs> I'd say we're pretty much compressed, you know? And so then, if you, if you want to uh, get a number, then you need to go what? Look in the compressed liquid tables, okay? And so, we go back to, 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 to the table here. And a compressed liquid or at the end of the superheat. So we gotta go down a little way. So there's, there's the saturated pressure table. And then more saturated. Oh, and also that critical pressure is listed in your saturation. It's the bottom entry. So it's probably, it's probably quicker to find it here than to find that table A1, but you know, it's listed either one. And that's the critical temperature that goes with it. Uh, 374.1. Okay, so here's the superheated vapor. So uh, there's a number of pages of that. So we got to roll through that. 
and there's compressed uh, liquid water. So we're, we're 300 bar. And see, this is nice because he gives you the conversion. He gives you bar and MPA both in the table. So sometimes if I'm not sure, if I want to convert and I got a round one, I'll just come running back here to the superheat tables to make sure that it's either that or look up the conversion factor. So it's just as easy for me to come back here. I mean, if you remember, you know, MPA times 10 is bar, but you know, it's hard to remember all this stuff. So anyway, whoops, there you go. Uh, so I've got 300 bar, 30 MPA. Well, look at that, 100. So it's dead in the table. I don't have to do any interpolation or anything. It's just right there. And so uh, that's, that's the uh, uh, specific volume. And again, it's been multiplied by a thousand. So I got to move the decimal point. So uh, that, that number uh, for that specific volume is 0 0.001029. Okay, look it up. And then we go back up here and we see if he got that one right and he got that one right. Well, no he didn't. Cause that's times 10, that one's wrong too. That's times 10 to the minus third, right? This guy, this guy, I don't know if this guy's gonna pass this test or not. <laughs> that's times 10 to the minus three. I'm pretty darn sure. Is that not what we saw over here? Yeah, I'll tell you. See what happens, graduate students. See, this is what graduate students do, you know? They hire these guys and put their graduate students on this, and this is what you get. I wonder if these guys could pass the FE exam. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. All right, so anyway, move the decimal point three places and you got the right answer. I didn't realize this one was that pitiful when I assigned it. Okay, so now we've got 10 megapascals and 485. Okay, so same game, same game. TV diagram, saturation dome. Here, he went ahead and drew the critical isobar, I guess because he just looked it up. <laughs> And uh, there's that critical temperature. That's uh, 374.14. And so if you draw a line straight across and you know we're at 485, so we're above that. And our, our pressure is what, 100 bar. And this, pre this critical pressure is 220.9. So we're less than that. So you just draw one in here and wherever you happen to feel like it, just for qualitative purposes, draw it up. And so, you know, we're up in a region like this, okay? Um, and you can check that uh, if you want to at, uh, at 100 bar. Let's go back to the uh, saturation tables. Uh, you get pretty good at these tables pretty quick. Uh, let's see, so there's, uh, that's still pressure. Well, now what were we? We were 100 bar, weren't we? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, they're at 100 bar pressure, the saturation temperature is uh, 311, okay? So at, then go, so see, this temperature where you're coming across the dome at 100 bar is 311.1. And you're at 485. So you have to be on the uh, isobar because that's your pressure. So you're way out here. So what's your state? Uh, superheated vapor, you know, you're way out there. Okay, so now when you take one look at that temperature, you can start saying dirty words because you know 485 ain't gonna be listed in that table. I'm sorry, you, we'll go look. So you're gonna to have to interpolate on this one. So we wanna to go to the what? The 100 bar table in the superheat. So here we go again, flying through the table. Superheat, uh, 
seven. Let's make things interesting. Bring Reverse it sweep. Let's go. 100 bar. God. And sure enough, uh, what do we got? We're, no we're 485. So I've got 480 and 520. So I'm in between these numbers. And so you have to interpolate. So basically what you do is you look at your 485, 485 minus 480 is five. And the total distance between these two numbers is what, 40. So you take five divided by 40 and multiply it times the difference between these numbers and then you take that result and you add it back onto this one. Now, if you're not good at interpolating, it's time. Your time has come to get good at interpolation. Now, you're doing this at home. I mean, I've, I've had people punch it on their programmable calculators. You, I guess at home, you can have an Excel sheet. You know, I mean, you know, what am I gonna do? <laughs> I ain't there looking over your shoulder, you know? but you got to make sure you understand how to interpolate, okay? There are some people, probably a lot of people, who will do it because you, or who will not do it because you cannot do it. Well, I would hope so. Because, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it's one of those things, okay, it's like when you, if you, if you skip swimming class, you know, you watched all the pictures, you've seen all the videos, you go, no problem. You're going on a, on a cruise, right? Well, you go out there and the second day, you fall, you fall in the water and the boat goes chugging off without you. And all of a sudden, you know what? This isn't exactly what I thought it was because I didn't really do it before. There you go. And you could wind up drowning. So, you know, part of your education to learn this stuff. And, you know, we're doing COVID crap. And so the world has changed a little bit. Um, I hope it goes back to the way it was, but you know. So anyway, enough, enough of me being on my soapbox. Okay, so this is the interpolation, and and you know that's that's what I said. But when you look at the numbers, see we're 485. The lower number in that table was 480, so you subtract those. The total distance to the next temperature was 540 minus 480, which is 40. So that's the percent that you are from the, from the 480 to the 540. And then you subtract the two numbers and then that difference uh, you have to uh, adjust. And I guess in this case, it's getting, in this case, they're getting smaller. So it's a negative. Yeah, you, you, take, the, you take the 520 number is smaller than the 480 number. So most of the time things are getting bigger, but in this case it's getting smaller. So this is gonna subtract off a little bit of this as it moves towards this number as the uh, temperature goes up. So anyway. Okay, and so that, that <laughs> and again, this is times 10 to the minus third, all of these. He just seems to be glossing over that part, sorry. Okay, and uh, so D, now we're at 80 degrees C, and X, X marks the spot, right? What is X? X is quality. X is one, means you're all vapor. X is zero, means you're all liquid on, on a mass basis. X equals 7.75, you're 75% vapor and 25% liquid in the container. If you're compressed liquid or superheated vapor, X has no meaning. It's only defined for the saturation dome. Okay. All right, so, so, so the, this one, as far as the diagram, is pretty easy. You know, you just gotta, you pick a temperature, put it on there, and then you put, put a little wingy down here for compressed liquid. Then this is the same temperature and the same pressure as we come across. And then the pressure goes up into superheat land uh, like this. And so we put a dot about three quarters of the way across and we say that's our state. Oh look, he found a times 10 to the minus third on this. <laughs>
But that, yeah, but he still leaves it off, yeah. yeah. Whatever. Um, okay, so we're at 80 degrees C. So let's go once again. So now where this is superheat, we don't want that. Then we come to pressure, we don't want that. And here's temperature, and here's 80, okay? Uh, let's see, so well, I guess we're doing volume again. So, so for the saturated uh, liquid at 80, it's, oh, I have an unstable internet connection here. Yeah. Tennessee Tech, um, 0 0.0010291 on the liquid and 3.407 on the vapor. See how, man, see how that spreads out when you vaporize it? It's amazing how the difference between those numbers. Okay, so we should see those numbers. Yeah. 3.407. I think I think his numbers are right, except he keeps forgetting the times 10 to the minus third. So this is just the um, the uh, how we use quality. You know, if if we have a state that's part vapor and part liquid saturation. So this would be the specific volume for the whole mixture. Okay. So we take the specific volume of the liquid plus the quality X, 0.75, times the difference uh, in the specific volume across the dome. So this is the specific volume of the gas or vapor minus the specific volume of the fluid. And then we add it on over here. And so basically we start over here, we get the difference across the dome in terms of specific volume. We take 75% of that di distance and we add it on to this one. And that gives us the specific volume for that mixture, okay? And that's the overall. Now, the liquid is still the smaller number and the uh, vapor is still the larger number, but when you put it all together into the container, total volume of the container divided by total mass, you're gonna get two point, or you're gonna get 0.002556, okay? Let's move on. Okay, I'm gonna close this one. Maybe we can. Okay, so I don't know, what, what are we doing here? Uh, waiting for this thing to respond. Okay, so uh, a tank contains a two-phase liquid vapor mixture of refrigerant 22. So in this, in, in this group of tables, the first one are water you know, saturation, superheated, compressed, all that. And then we've got, um, we've got R22, we've got R134A, we've got ammonia, I think we got propane. So, and, but it all works the same. You just go to a different table and get a different number. But the concepts are all identical, you know. So if you can do it for water, you can do it for R22, you just gotta find the table on a different page, okay. Okay, so we've got two phase. So we got a container here and we're told that we've got 25 kilograms of saturated liquid. Uh, we don't know how much vapor, but we know that the quality of the whole container is 0.6, okay? Uh, quality is 60%. Determine the volume of the tank in meters cubed and the fraction of the total volume occupied by the saturated vapor, okay? So it's always good to draw the diagram just to, you know, make sure everything's clear in your mind. So same old thing, TS diagram. Uh, we know we're inside the dome, so we just draw one isobar. And let's see, and we know that pressure, it's 10 bar. So that's pretty good. So, you know, what, what's the first thing you wanna do? Well, first thing you wanna do is you wanna go find this point and this point. If you're doing specific volume here, so in turn, you, you wanna know the specific volume of the saturated liquid and the specific volume of the saturated vapor, okay? Well, and so let's go do that. Uh, all right, so this is what, R1. R22, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, compress. 
that's solid. R22, and what, what were we? We were 10 bar, weren't we? Yeah. So we gotta go down to the saturated pressure. Here we go. Bop, 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 boom. Okay, so here's, here's 10 bar. So see, there's my temperature. If I'm saturated at 10 bar, I gotta be 23.4 degrees C. That's the specific volume of the liquid, and that's the specific volume of the vapor, and we better check our 10 to the third, yeah. The liquid is still, gotta move the decimal point three places. So this number should be what, 0 .000, 0, right? Because, yeah, it's a, yeah, okay. So there's three, I've already, uh, yeah, one, two. It's gonna be 0 .000, 0 0.000.8352. And this one is the, just the number, 0 .0236. Okay, let's see if that, uh, if, oh, I don't know how to make that thing go up. Okay. Yep. <laughs> oh, I have my issues. Don't I? Okay. Um, did I see a mistake in this equation? What's wrong? Uh, there be a VX right there? That X. See, this is the specific volume at quality. This is the specific volume of the fluid. So another mistake. I can't even write the, I can't even copy the equations out of the book right. Anyway, so uh, since we know quality, this is my overall specific volume, right? So this is the uh, liquid at this point. This is the distance across the dome from here to here. And I'm told I'm 60% of it. So I take 0.6 of that difference, add it onto here and I get, um, Let's see. I guess he's done this right. It looks right. Yeah, it looks like he did that right. Point uh, zero one four four nine. Okay. Okay. So then, now if you think about this, I mean you can common sense this out pretty well. So if sixty percent of the mass is vapor, what percent is liquid? Uh, 40, I think, because that's all that's in the tank, right? So if 40% is liquid, and I know I got 25 kilograms of liquid, if I divide this by 0.4, you know, that's, that, 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 that pretty well ought to tell me the total mass in the tank, right? Well, see, that's, he's using the equation down here, and so, this is uh, what the mass of the fluid is the total mass times one minus X. So anyway, he's just using this quality in order to calculate. So that's the way I would do. It. I would just think that, you know, I got 20, I got 25 kilograms here. That's 40% because the 60% is vapor. So 40% is liquid Divide it by 0.4 and you get 62 and a half kilograms. Just the debt. That's total mass. That's total mass, right? Because if, if I multiply this by 0 0.4, it's gotta give me 25 back, right? Because 40% of the, of the container is liquid. So, yeah, I mean, just don't get lost in these equations. Just, you know, I mean, some of these things are pretty simple. You just got to get it set in your mind. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's funny. I know in physics and chemistry, man, they beat you to death on significant figures. You get over here to engineer, you know, if you take a measurements class or something, but once you get into these kinds of courses, we, it just kind of disappears. I had, man, I hadn't worried about significant figures, especially in thermo for a while. I, I mean, you, you know, it is a consideration, but we don't talk about it much, you know? So get out there in the workplace. Yeah, because, you know, 
if, if, if you've got a number that's like only good to a tenth, and you've got a number over here with four decimal places, when you multiply them together, all those extra decimal places don't mean anything because of the uncertainty in this number. So, I mean, you do have to take that in consideration, but, you know, I wonder, I, I'm gonna look in the index on the thermal book and see if it even has significant, if anybody got a book in here? Look and see if it's even significant, if it's even in the index. I bet it's not in there. It's not even in there. And they wrote the book. So there you go. Say, and on the test, you're just going to be selecting a number from a list. So you got to pick the best answer. So we're, we're going to be taking this through the quiz? Thing. Through iLearn. Yeah, this thing is on iLearn. And it's through the quiz? Yes. Yes. No, no, no. It is a quiz you take in iLearn. And guess what? When you submit, it will give you a grade instantly. Now, I don't know if you consider that good news or bad news. <laughs> I guess it depends on how you do. But you will get, I mean, I've got it set up to give you a grade right there. What? No. 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 I got 70 of you people. I don't know. I got to look at all that. Okay. Okay, so then uh, the volume is the specific volume. Th this would be for the whole container, cat V, right? Well, so the specific volume for the whole container is this, 0 0.01449. And so times the total mass, which is 62 and a half. So that container is 0 0.9056 meters cubed. Okay. Uh, volume occupied by the saturated vapor. Well, so it's the mass of the saturated vapor, the 62 and a half minus 25 times the specific volume of the saturated vapor. So Look at this. I got 0 0.9056 meters cubed and 0.885 of those are vapor and the rest is um, occupied by the liquid and the fraction occupied by the vapor is 97.7% of the container. That's how spread out that is and that's how concentrated the mass is in the liquid state. So what is that? 2.3% of the container contains um, that 25 kilograms, which is 40% of the mass in there. So, okay. Put that. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, got, got a piston cylinder two kilograms of R134A undergoes our friend the polytropic process uh, in a piston cylinder assembly from initial state of saturated vapor. So we're starting at saturated vapor at two bar to a final state of uh, 12 bar 80 degrees C. Determine work. So, you know, this is piston cylinder type work, but it's not constant pressure. So here we've plotted a PV diagram. And if you're going to plot up work, you want to do a PV diagram, right? Because work is the, the area under the curve, under the process line on a PV diagram. So it's the integral of PDV. So we want to go from one to two. So really we want this area coming down there. But since we got this relationship, we're going to have to integrate, you know, the polytropic expression, which we've already done. But... Um, okay, so, you know, closed system, we don't have any mass crossing boundaries or anything like that. And we've got polytropic uh, expression holds for the process. Um, so assuming that N is not one, we've already done this integral. And so, you know, you don't have to reintegrate it every time you get a polytropic process. So this you know, total work is the mass 
times the integral of pressure times specific volume. And so it's mass times P2V2 minus P1V1 divided by one minus M. That's the equation we developed that's in the textbook and all that sort of thing. Um, so, but on this one, the, this is one little way these problems get given. Uh, we have to determine the exponent N, okay? And so basically what you gotta do is, you know, you can write P1 V1 to the N as P2 V2 to the N. You juggle it around like this, and then you take the log of both sides and then, you know, this, the, what the, this term becomes N uh, log V2 over V1, and then you uh, divide by that term to the other term, and then you solve for N. So I'm sure you remember that, but anyway, I wanted to make sure that we review it. Okay, so um, once you realize that, then it's just a matter of finding uh, your states. Uh, let's see, so we're saturated liquid at, uh, what are we starting at? We're at two bar, and this is 134. Uh, I'll just have to pull that guy down. That's what we're doing. Okay, so that's R20. I think the next one is 134. Yeah, 134 A, and that's the temperature table. Uh, that's the pressure. Two bar. Ooh, stuff's a little chilly, isn't it? Minus 10.09 degrees C. Well, that's why it's called a refrigerant, right? When you drop pressure on it, it gets cold. That's called the Joule-Thompson coefficient that will, uh, you probably get to that in thermo too, but that's a property of a refrigerant. Uh, Okay, so what were we looking for? We're looking for what, specific volume? Yeah, no, no, yeah, okay. Specific volume and it's saturated uh, vapor. So there it is. It's 0 .0, 0 0 0.0993, I believe. That's, uh, that's the saturated uh, pressure table for 134. Oh, is this a U.S.? Whoops. No, this is this is metric. No, you've got a set of tables. If it's a, has an E after it, it's in English units. Yeah. If it doesn't have an E, then it's it's SI or metric. So you're looking in the E table. Get out of the E table. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there we go. Point zero nine nine three. That's correct. And then, um, okay, so we got another state, twelve bar and eighty C. And you know he's showing you, he's showing you this as superheated. Um, you know somehow you have to figure that out. Uh, you can look at twelve bar and uh, see what the saturation temperature is. Uh, I guess we should probably do that. So if I look at 12 bar, 12 bar saturation temperature is 46. Okay, well, I'm way hotter than 46. So these are higher and higher temperatures I come out here, so I'm superheated, okay? Now, Life would be really nice if I could find 12 bar and 80 degrees C in the superheat table and I didn't have to interpolate. So let's see, 12 bar. I'm very hopeful. 12 bar and 80 degrees C, yeehaw. We're living right. Okay, and let's see, this one is not times 10 to the minus third, or times 10 to the plus third, I guess. So we don't have to adjust decimal point on this one. So 80, so this is point, 
zero two zero five one. Okay. And hopefully point zero two zero five one. There we go. I guess we didn't have to adjust this other one either, did we? No, we didn't. That's right. Okay. Uh, so here's the equation that we're plugging into, I guess over here really. And so we just plug in numbers. Um, I was, you know, you can take natural logs or you can take log to the base 10, it doesn't matter. The base on the logarithm doesn't change the result. So, but he shows natural logs and that works. I punch this up just to, just to make sure it was right. And so that gives you, um, the uh, n number that we need. And then we're just gonna plug into this expression for the work. That's polytropic work. Okay. There you go. And is this work, is this positive work or negative work? Positive work, are you sure? I That's correct. So this should be negative work, right? Because it puts energy in the system. And so we, you know, the, the, the first law, you know, has a minus sign in it. And so in order for energy to increase, because see the energy has got to increase. E2 has got to be more than E1 because we're cramming energy into that thing. Well, if there's a minus sign in the equation, then we got to have another minus sign to turn that positive because the energy term is E2 minus E1. And if that's got to get bigger, it can't be negative on the other side. See what I'm saying? So I know these definitions are hell. I find it difficult to think of a steam locomotive. There you go. Um, heat in, increase the energy, and then that energy that you do work There you go. I mean, you know you're making progress when you know the definition and you can, you have a simple little example in your mind that lets you keep it straight. All right, so I think that's the end of this one. Uh, this was, um, this is 23. These are all probably, you have all of these solutions. <laughs> now, I'm not, unfortunately, they're not all quite correct. <laughs> I apologize for that. But anyway, uh, you have them. Okay, so let's see. Let's close that one and go on to this. So now we're going to go to um, 330. I could make that a little bit bigger. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. So I guess we could read it, but we can. Oh, okay, I, I think this is just uh, evaluating internal energy. We want to count, given some, uh, given enough information to find a state, we want to evaluate uh, temperatures and internal energies and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think this is water vapor. Uh, so, uh, A, the, the first problem, we've got three bar and we've got a specific volume of 0.5. Okay, so, and you can see this next thing says table A3, that's the saturated pressure table. And so we'll go verify that, but he's saying this 0.5 meters cubed per kilogram is in between. So we'll look up over here at three bar, we'll look up this number and this number, but he is assuring us, at least on this solution, because he did that, and that, that number should be in between. Now let's go look. So we want three bar. A bunch of tables. Getting close. Okay. This is water and this is pressure table. Three bar right here. Three bar. And so this one is times 10. So we got to move the decimal point on this one. 
So this is 0 0.001 and this is 0 0.6, okay? So 0 0.5 is definitely in between. So you are inside the dome at three bar. And so what's your temperature? Well, your temperature is 133.6, has to be, okay? Now see, if you look up 130, if you could look up 133.6 in the temperature table, it would tell you three bar. You say, well, we can't do that. 133.6, say I got 130 and 140, but see three bar is in between here. And so I could interpolate, you know, if you want to interpolate, you can, you know, I mean, it, it, it works, they're consistent. Okay. So let's go back. Okay, so that's all true. And so now he's solving for the quality. And so we, we know what the overall specific volume in the container is. And so this is the, uh, uh, the equation. He's gone ahead and solved it. You know, if you, if you put it back in its normal form, you'd have to multiply across by this, you know, put brackets around this and multiply over here and then move the, the specific volume of the liquid back over here. And, and that, that's the correct equation because it's specific volume of the, uh, of the liquid on this side plus X times the distance across the dome. So he's got that correct. But you know, after you do a few of these, I mean, you just write it down because it becomes part of you. Okay. Um, so the, the 0.5 is for our mixture in the container. And then so we've got the fluid and this guy's got, got his uh, exponents is times 10 to the minus third in there. So he's got 10732 and 0.65, 0 0.6058, we can check. Uh, 3.6058, right. So this one's dead on, correct. Okay, and so that says that we're 82.5% uh, vapor. That's what quality means. So we're, what is that? Uh, uh, so was that 16, and, is that 17, 17.5%? What is that? Yeah, whatever. 100 minus 82.5 is the amount of liquid. Okay, and so for internal energy, so we use that same quality. We use the same equation. We just change the V's to use. That's exactly the same equation. Okay, and so we go back over to the table and we look up the internal energy numbers. So three, uh, let's see. So that's right here, these two columns. And so at three, on the vapor, it's 2543.6. And on the liquid, it's 561.15. And we plug those in. Yep, 561.15, perfect. That's our quality. And so that's our internal energy for the, for the overall container. Some of it's in the vapor, some of it's in the liquid, but when you put it all together for the container, it's uh, 2196.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. We got another one. We got a bunch of these. I don't know. Do we need to keep doing these? I think you guys are probably good on this. Let me, huh? Let me get on because one or two of these problems are, I think, a little more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, if you look in that table under, it's the, look under the three, uh, what are we, we were three bar, weren't we? Yeah, three, three bar under the internal energy numbers, saturated liquid and saturated vapor. You got them? Okay. All right, let's see here. Let's try this guy. Yeah, this is a this is a pretty good problem. Okay, so 
This is a little power cycle, okay? They got a system with two kilograms of carbon dioxide, CO2. Initially, one bar, 300K. Then it goes a power cycle with the following. So we've got three processes. One to two, constant volume where the pressure goes up. So that would be like a heat addition, transfer heat in, burn some fuel, put some heat in this stuff. And then we do an expansion. So that could be in a piston cylinder. We've held the piston constant, put the heat in, then we let the, we let the gas expand, push the piston back, we get some work out. Uh, and then we got to compress it back so that we can go through the cycle again. So it goes right back to the same point one. So we've got three uh, processes. Uh, so the first one is constant volume. The second one is polytropic with an exponent of 1.28 equals constant on specific volume. And then it's constant pressure, uh, compression. No, because we're going to reject heat from this in order to, because you start squeezing in, it would want to start heating up. And so you got to transfer heat out to, in order to keep it at the same uh, pressure. Okay, so uh, uh, just discretion, all this stuff, process. Uh, we're just restating all this. So anyway, let's look at the uh, diagram here. Okay, so for one to two, constant specific volume, constant volume. The mass is constant, we don't have any change of mass. And then we have our expansion, and then we have our uh, compression process at constant pressure. So we wanna calculate the thermal efficiency of this cycle. Ah, this is good stuff. Okay, so let's look at uh, first process one to two. Well, it's constant volume and we, it's a control mass. So you can write the ideal gas law twice. Basically what they're doing is they write um, PV is equal to MRT at one, PV is equal to MRT at two, and then you can start canceling out constant terms. So the mass can cancel out, the volumes can cancel out, and the gas constant can cancel out. So all you wind up with is, um, the pressures and the temperatures. And so you know uh, the uh, pressures and you know the initial temperature. And so you're solving right here for T2, okay? So just an ideal gas law solution. And so it winds up, it's four times. So it's 1200K. So we start out at 300, and we wind up up here at two at 1200K. Okay. okay, so uh, if, we, and there's some unit issues in this as well, I think, but uh, anyway. So we can calculate uh, the volumes constant. And so we know temperatures and pressures at state one, and we know the mass that's given. So this is just, evaluating uh, uh, the, the volume, solving for V1. So, you know, like PV is equal to MRT, all evaluated at one, and it happens to be the same at volume at two. But anyway, so when you do this, and this is uh, just meters cubed, this kilogram unit should not be there because uh, he's got mass in here. And so you got kilogram there and kilogram there, so it cancels out. So that's a mistake, but the, uh, uh, I think the number's right. Okay, so then uh, if we want the specific volume at two, well, if this is total volume and we've got uh, two kilograms, you basically divide this by two and you get uh, 0.567 meters cubed per kilogram, and that's correct, okay? And noting that uh, P3 is equal to P1, which is all one bar. So see, this is all constant pressure across here. So, um, <clears throat> and this is the exponent, the, the N 
on the polytropic relation is 1.28. So this is one of the polytropic uh, relations. So we can solve for, uh, this would say that uh, specific volume three over specific volume two is P2 over P3 raised to the one over uh, N. And so plugging in this, we get specific volume at three is 1.675 meters cubed per kilogram. Okay, and then we can solve for the temperature at three from the ideal gas law. Um, and so uh, PV is equal to uh, RT. And so solving for T3, we get 887 degrees K. And so now we can take a look at all of that. So uh, we, we have our specific volumes, we have our pressures, and we have our temperatures all around the cycle. So once you have that, then we can get down to, um, we're gonna have to apply the uh, first law for each one of these processes. Well, so this is a PV diagram. So how much work do we have from one to two? Or how much area do we have under that curve? None. So the work is zero, okay, from one to two. So we know that by inspection. And so that says that uh, the change in internal energy is equal to the heat transfer, or the heat transfer is the mass times the uh, internal energy per unit mass, specific internal energy, which would be U2 minus U1. And so we can look this up. And so let's do that. Let's see, this is, what are we, what's our gas here? This is CO2, okay. Uh, I think that will take me here. And we gotta go down a ways. Yeah, CO2, rotate clockwise. Okay, so there's my CO2 table. That's A23. Oh, and let's see, what's my temperature? Let's get a couple temperatures here. Where am I doing that? Okay, so it's uh, one and two. So one is, a, it's a hundred and twelve hundred. Okay. Uh-huh, a hundred. What is that? That's 273. Because <laughs> this is in, oh no, we are Kelvin. That's right, thank heavens. Ah, what is this? Was it 300? It was 300, thank you. Whew. I've done too many problems. Okay, so, so this is uh, enthalpy. Here's your internal energy. So that's a comma. So that's uh, 6,939 kilojoules per k-mole. K-mole, oh, that's a low blow. So now I'm gonna have to go find the molecular weight and divide by molecular weight. That's why I wanted to do this problem, just, okay. So now we got, that's one of them, and the 1200 is doo -doo -doo right here, and the internal energy, good gosh, 43,871, Lord of mercy. Let's see, 43,871 minus 6939, divided by 44.01 molecular weight of CO2. Carbon's 12, what's, um, oxygen's 32 and some change. There you go. And notice that molecular weight, if you're in metric, it's kilojoules per k-mole. If you're in US units, it's pounds per pound mole. But it's the same number. That's the magic, the magic quality of molecular weights, okay? So there you have it, two kilograms. And the, the heat is definitely going in because that temperature is going sky high. So that's positive.
Okay, so so we got we got this guy, no work, and we got the heat transfer for this one. So now we want this guy. So um, this definitely has work because we've got area on that, and that work is the gas doing work on the surroundings. So that's going to be positive, right? The, the work itself, and then this one will be negative because this is the gas doing work, or the surroundings doing work on the gas because it's compressing. Lots of lots of lots of things to think about. Okay, so process two three. Integral PDV, and I mean we've all this we've already integrated it. You know you can look it up, or if you want to do the integral, knock yourself out. But you're going to get this. So remember we're we're, we're working with specific volume here, so we got to multiply by mass. If we were working with cap V, then we wouldn't have to. You know the total extent of the system would already be included. But in this case. We don't. So this is specific volume. So we got to have the mass out here. And notice, um, if this if this is an ideal gas, PV is equal to MRT, right? Why well, the M's out here? So PV is equal to RT. So P3 V3 is equal to RT3. So you can substitute. So that's what he's done. He substituted in here, and then he's because we well he just. Did. I mean, I think we know the specific volumes as well, but anyway, uh, you could do it either way. Um, and so your two kilograms, there's R, universal gas constant divided by molecular weight. Don't forget, it's a specific gas constant. And there's your temperature difference, one minus the exponent. And so we're getting. Um, uh, 422.4 kilojoules, and so he's, he's writing that that's uh, energy that's coming out of the city. That's work that's appearing in the surroundings. Okay. Okay. So then let's see. So we're, and then two, two, so we're down to two, three. So we're still on two, three, so we have the work term, but we have a heat transfer term as well. And so, let's see, you, whoa, 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 we're using the energy balance. Delta Ke. Okay, the change in internal. Oh, oh sorry, that, that's just the assumption. I'm sorry. I thought he was writing the whole law over there for a second. Uh, my bad. Um, okay, so this is uh, delta U is equal to Q minus W. And so uh, we can solve for Q minus W. We simply uh, take the work to the other side of the equation. And so, you know, we look these things up. You know, we, we just, we, we have the same high temperature, but we, well, it's eight. But it's eight. Uh, it's eight eighty-seven. So you're going to have to interpolate for that one in the tables. As we can look at that, eight eighty-seven. See what number he's got. He's got about twenty-three thousand three forty-three at eight eighty-seven. Oops. This one. What? Don't tell me I didn't close. Okay. 880 and there's 890 so it's in between there 29 looks like it's probably been 29 400 something like that eyeball interpolation yeah 29 3 43 whatever okay so doing the math on this that we see that we're um, losing 237.8 kilojoules to the surroundings. And then for the last process, uh, this one, the work is simply the area under the curve, which is the rectangle, which is nice. And notice we start here and wind up over here. Uh, so there we go, it's the mass. 
times the pressure times uh, delta V, uh, V1 minus V3. So this is where we wind up and this is where we start. So see that's just the area under that curve, the pressure times delta V. Uh, and since it's an ideal gas, he's going to go ahead and make that uh, uh, substitution that uh, it's constant pressure. So, you know, so uh, P1, V1, P3, V3, you can substitute the ideal gas law, do it with temperatures. And so this is work that's coming into the system. So it's a negative. Okay. Whew. Now, so the overall energy balance then becomes, well, let's see. I guess we got to do the uh, heat transfer for the last uh, uh, process from three back to one. So change in internal energy plus the work. So again, I think you all know where to go get that stuff now. And so this comes out to, uh, 1240 kilojoules are lost to the surroundings. So finally, for the whole cycle, we simply add up the work terms, work one, work two, work three, and the QN, the costly input, happens in the first process. That's why how we go from 300 to 1200K. So that's what we're paying for. Okay. So there we go. So the network of the cycle, it's uh, W23 plus W31 divided by Q12. Plugging in the numbers, we get a whopping almost 12% efficiency <laughs> out of our cycle. Eh, not so good, but nonetheless, pretty darn good problem. And so we, we, we do remember that net for a cycle net work is equal to net heat. So we can add up the heat exchanges. And so you, th this is the net, these are the three heat exchanges. And then these are the, this is the, the work um, uh, two, three plus work three, one, and say they come out to be virtually the same. So he's got a little round off error. Just say, and then um, uh, the, the, the book has, if you buy the brand new copy of the book, you get this software. And I don't usually emphasize that because I know a lot of people don't. So anyway, you can, he's got some software where you can model this stuff in it as well. And you know, you can plot up efficiencies for different pressure ratios and stuff. But anyway, I wouldn't expect you to do that. Okay, there was a question. Yeah. No, <laughs> I got you. I got your attention on this one, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. But I'm telling you, take steam power plants. You know, this is the stuff you do in the in the. Well, I'll tell you, in the second thermo two class, yeah, you you would do a problem like this in thermo two, where you actually work your way all the way around the cycle, Rankine cycle, Brayton cycle gas turbine cycle, steam turbine cycle, all that sort of thing. In here, I wanted to work through this because it illustrates working all the way around a cycle. It illustrates that net heat is equal to net work and you divide by the costly heat transfer. So, I mean, this is, this is one more step. This is the furthest step we've taken to a practical problem in this class so far. And, and it's pretty good and it illustrates, you know, a lot of the different concepts. Uh, you're probably not going to have one like this because, uh, I mean, you've got, well, I don't know if you got 20, you probably have, I didn't count them up, you probably have 13, 12, 13 calculation, but they're a small calculation, it might be find a state or, you know, to calculate an internal energy, you know, just a small piece of one of these, you know, it may have to do a quick energy balance and solve for something, you know. Just want, to, just want to make sure that you can do the very fundamental things that and a, a lot a lot of it's been illustrated in these problems today. So if you could if you can study through these problems and understand and correct all the errors that are in there. So just just because you don't agree with an answer here 
don't necessarily think you're wrong. Because you know, these things you see, how many errors did we find today? Most of the numbers are not so bad, the final answers. They've kind of checked those, but units and stuff like that may be uh, off a little bit. Let's see how we do in here. Oh uh, yeah, I think that's, I don't have time to do another one. So I'm gonna cut this off. Um, I'll be emailing you out your tables and all that stuff. And a reminder, make sure you can log into iLearn. Um, I'm having, I'm struggling a little bit getting it posted in all three sections, but I've got a appointment with the iLearn people this afternoon. Um, so you should be, if you can't see it Monday, then you should probably email me and just say, hey, I mean, you won't be able to open it, but you ought to be able to see that there's a test there, say Monday sometime. Now, hopefully I'll get that, all that issue worked out today and tomorrow. Okay, good luck, have fun with it. Thermal's good stuff now, I'm gonna tell you. Dr. Uh, Cunningham. Y'all have a great rest of the day. Dr. Cunningham, I had a quick question. 